ピカピーピカチュピカピカ。I've been a fan of Pokemon since I was in the first grade, when it first made waves across the United States. As a result, I was basically contractually obligated to collect the cards, play the games, consume all the anime goodness, and yes, see the movies. Shortly after it was translated and released to the United States, Pokemon the first movie made quite a splash in theaters. By no means was this in a financial or critical sense, mind you, but it certainly helped establish itself as a cultural phenomenon like nothing else before it. Plus, with a braggadocious title like the first movie, you know there's going to be a sequel or two. Or 20. And a remake of the same film nearly 20 years later. God, I'm old. Anyways, Pokemon the first movie Mewtwo Strikes Back hits theaters, and it brings with it the whimsy and fun of the anime to the big screen, where it then decides to rip out the hearts of kids everywhere by making Ash die and Pikachu cry. It also has a slightly confusing plot, mainly because Pokemon is all about super-powered animals duking it out in dog fights like you've never seen, but the movie's message is that that's bad, but they don't really stop. Either way, it was an instant success with kids when it released, and many of us bright-eyed youngsters who saw it when we were younger remember it fondly, even if it really hasn't aged well. But after the third or fourth film, I kind of stopped watching them. I'd long since stopped watching the anime, and collecting the cards and playing the games was more just a habit at this point that I fell in and out of over the years. So please forgive me if I don't have the deep lore background understanding for Volcanian and the mar mechanical m what? What is it? What? What is this? And for the longest time, that's pretty much where I stood in terms of the films. I still play the games, I still collect the cards, but don't really watch the show or the films anymore. I was more, you know, aware of their existence, but too focused on other things to really care to watch them. Then along comes Ryan Reynolds. When a Detective Pikachu movie was first announced, I kind of scratched my head. Were they really going to make a film based off of this somewhat obscure 3DS title that holds your hand throughout the entire game and has very little to no actual mystery behind it? Apparently yes. Yes it will. And it will be live action with Ryan Reynolds starring as the voice of the titular Electric Mouse. Now obviously I was pretty apprehensive given the string of cinematic bombs that were video game films, and the seemingly odd choice of Ryan Reynolds as the voice of Pikachu. Especially since normally, it sounds like this. Pika -pi, Pika but then trailers started to drop and, I gotta say, some of that old whimsy and probably a healthy dose of nostalgia made me feel like this was gonna be a good film? Was it possible that a video game movie made by people who actually cared about what they were making, rather than having a movie for the sake of merchandising opportunities or because a p company bought the rights to the property years ago was actually going to come out? All signs seem to point to yes, and after seeing the film, I can happily say that it kind of does live up to the hype. The first and most obvious thing that is great about this film is the live action designs for all the Pokemon. Everyone was talking about them when the first trailer hit, and they pretty much stick through the entire film as one of the best parts of it. As RJ Palmer, the artist behind some truly impressive works of realistic Pokemon puts it, he was offered the job when the production team behind this film googled realistic Pokemon designs and found his work. And I can definitely say that that was probably the right call to make. Every Pokemon in this film is distinct from one another, and when you have shots that have 20 plus different Pokemon through a crowd or, you know, flying above, it's usually easy to discern which one is which. Each design is also relatively proportional to the canon heights of the games, meaning we can finally see just how oddly large a snubble can be. Even better is the amount of detail that each design implores. Charizard looks wrinkly yet scaly, Bulbasaur is adorable and reptilian looking, and Mr. Mime is a walking nightmare with dodgeballs for shoulders. While the film utilizes a few key Pokemon for a lot of the background and crowd shots, it's still pretty easy to tell which one is which and had me spending a good portion of the film looking to see all the various Pokemon that can be seen. For the sake of example, compare this image of Charizard with its anime design and this image of the new Sonic versus the original design. 
With Sonic, it more looks like they made conscious decisions to make him look more human, and not just in the teeth department, which is still just nightmare fuel. His proportions, his feet, his hands, just about all of it looks like a man in a surprisingly well-articulated costume rather than anything resembling the blue blur. The Pokemon in this film, however, each have subtle design choices to them that help them stand out from one another and make them more recognizable. If you were to take that Charmander and make it a little bit more like a realistic animal rather than what its actual design looks like, you'd probably get something like this, and yeah, that wouldn't really fit that well. And yes, I know the Sonic movie said that they changed the design of Sonic or whatever, but like, that's a whole other can of worms that I, I really don't have time to open up today. While the designs of the Pokemon themselves are good, I really can't say the same for the story. But given that this is a kid's movie, let alone a Pokemon one, I kind of expected that going in. And even then, there were a few general surprises that were either welcome additions, unneeded plot points for the sake of runtime or action sequences, confusing divergences from the source material, or a combination of the three. The story has us following Tim Goodman, played by Justice Smith, heading to Rhyme City to say goodbye to his detective father who passed away in a car accident. While in his father's apartment, he runs into Detective Pikachu, an amnesia-riddled Pikachu with a caffeine addiction and the voice of Deadpool that only Tim can hear. Pikachu sort of manages to strong-arm Tim into helping him figure out what happened to Harry, his father, and what happened to his own memories all while uncovering a plot to potentially end the harmony found within Rhyme City thanks to a mysterious gas-based compound simply called R that turns Pokemon into wild, ravenous beasts. The story itself is pretty basic and has a very obvious twist to it, but as I said before, it's a kid's movie, and it doesn't really hold back from that or try to talk down to the audience in any way. The film's setting of Rhyme City is a place where Pokemon and humans live together, so things like Pokemon battles and the games and show aren't really the focus of this film. The one or two fights we do get are well executed and somewhat make sense for the story, and at no time during them do we have some character off to the side yelling at us for dog fighting with our special super powered little animal friends. As for Detective Pikachu and Tim, they have a good chemistry together, and it's enjoyable to watch them interact with each other and the rest of the decent enough cast. Justice Smith plays the straight man to Ryan Reynolds, who spouts out so many PG to PG-13 Ryan Reynolds jokes during the film's runtime that I honestly thought it could just be a pitch reel for a PG-13 Deadpool 3. Hey bud, what are you doing? I can't do it when people are watching. All that said, this movie is not perfect by any means. Now I want to talk about a few things that the plot does that bother me. If you want to avoid spoilers, go to the time card on screen for my final thoughts on the film. If you don't mind spoilers or have already seen the film, then I guess you can stay if you want. First off, the giant Torterra scene is completely unneeded in this film, and I feel like it was just placed in there for a fun, trippy action sequence that would logically be impossible for our protagonists to survive, but they somehow do anyways. I get that the whole point of this scene is supposed to be a surprise about how big the genetic altering of the Torterra we see earlier in the film can get them to become, but it genuinely does nothing to advance the plot, other than having Pikachu get hit with a small rock and almost die. Howard's switch to the villain towards the end of the film felt really forced, and, and I feel like if they had gone the route of his son trying to be the one to transfer his father's consciousness into Mewtwo so that he could save his life, rather than he himself? it might have worked a little bit better. What we get instead is a horribly done twist so we can see him turn humans into Pokemon, which is meant to clue in the audience that maybe hasn't figured it out already into the fact that Tim's dad has been Pikachu this whole time. And probably the big thing that bothers me the most at the end is Miss Norman, who it turns out is just Howard's ditto in disguise. There's a fun fight scene with the Ditto that keeps transforming into different Pokemon and attacking Tim or whoever needs to be attacked in that point of the scene, but I always thought that Ditto couldn't transform into humans. And like, the whole BDI thing, while a fun visual gag for the film, wasn't always a Ditto staple and just something that some Ditto did because they couldn't quite transform right and it's now just become like the identity of the Pokemon. It's sort of explained away with a hand wavy sort of line like, oh, it's genetically altered so it can become human if it wants, but it's just, it felt really forced and again, like it was put in there for the sake of an action sequence. But in general, my complaints with the films don't really stop me from enjoying myself. 
Some of the plot points can be considered plot holes or whatever, but in general it's just a fun, visually well-crafted film that I enjoyed watching from start to finish. As an adult with the attention span and oftentimes mind of a child, it was awesome to see some of my favorite Pokemon in a more realistic setting, making some of my childhood fantasies have a more solid grounding now. While the film isn't perfect, it does have a lot of genuine heart and love behind it, which is more than you can say about some other live-action video game films. The film is fun, whimsical, and full of just so much attention to detail that it's hard not to like it. And whether you're a kid, an adult who's still a kid inside, a Pokemon fan, or an avid moviegoer or gamer, I say don't skip out on this one. It's rare we get a video game movie that's genuinely good, and if we choose to support a film like this that's actually got some heart behind it rather than just some cheap cash grab that references as many pop culture things as it can for the sake of jokes, I think it'll mean we'll get more films that are good, as well as from franchises we've wanted to see on the big screen for years. While I wouldn't claim this to be one of my favorites of all time in terms of movies or even Pokemon media, I say that it's certainly worth it to catch this one out in theaters. Plus, if you're like me and you collect the Pokemon cards, they give you a pack with two of them anyway. I got a Psyduck and a Detective Pikachu card, so yay me.